Now that we've talked about work and energy and various forms of energy, we just want to apply that to simple machines. So simple machines have been around for ages. You have levers, uh, wheel and axle, pulley, inclined plane, wedge, and screw. And we just want to look at the physics of that and be able to make a definition for mechanical advantage and the efficiency of a machine. So there's six things here, but um, a wedge, a screw, and an inclined plane are just variations on a, on a theme here. A wedge is just two inclined planes fused together, and then you hit it with a hammer and it gets a very large mechanical advantage. A screw is just simply an inclined plane that's wrapped around that cylinder, and the threads of the screw are shown there. So simple machines, we're gonna first look at the ideal circumstance, ideally or theoretically or 100% efficient. We're gonna define that term, but we'll just rely on your uh, instinct of what that word means for now. So the main idea behind a simple machine. So we're gonna just let this little thing represent all, an umbrella of all types of machines, gears, pulleys, levers, inclined planes, everything. So this is just kind of like a magical box. We're going to call it a machine. And what we're going to do is we're going to put work into the machine. And we do that by putting a force through a distance. But we put work into the machine and we get work out of a machine. Another way of saying that is that we put force and distance into the machine and we get force and distance out of the machine. Did you catch the magic there though? Let me play that again. We can put a force and a distance in and we get out a force and a distance. So here's the big idea. You put work in, you get work out. Or you could say you do work on the machine and then the machine does work on something else. And since work is force times distance, how machines typically work, and this is the magic I was referring to, you could put in a little bit of force through a lot of distance to the machine and the machine will get out a lot of force but only a little bit of distance. That's the big idea. But force times distance is work, and force times distance is work. So a simple machine here uh, would be like a floor jack, where you put a little bit of force on that handle and move that handle a long distance. So you're going to put in a little bit of force through a long distance. You're doing work on the machine. And the machine is going to get out a lot of force, but just a little distance. So you go whoosh, and this goes eep, whoosh, whip. Okay, so a lot of distance out just a little bit, did, just out, out a little bit of distance, but the neat thing is you can get out a lot of force by putting in just a little bit of force. An inclined plane. So here this person is going to go up the inclined plane and we want to see how much force they would have to push to make that happen. So let's say they weigh 140 pounds. So they're gonna be able to put a force into the machine. In this, in this case, it's the wheel. They're gonna put a force onto the wheel and then the whole wheelchair is going to do work being able to lift out 140 pounds. So what force do we have to put in through this distance to be able to lift this up this distance? Okay, well, just the force in times the distance in should equal the force out times the distance out. And it's gonna be uh, 35 pounds. One way to see that though, is that the distance in is four times the distance out. So we should get out four times as much force as we put in. Pulleys. This is a pulley off of a large overhead crane. And this cable here comes down, goes around a pulley, around another pulley, around this pulley, and back up, and that cable is just attached right there. 
Well, let's see what happens uh, when the, the motor right here winds that cable up. The motor is going to put a force on that cable, and that's going to be tension. Tension goes throughout the entire cable in every direction. So if I have a certain amount of force here, I'll have that same amount of force down here in the cable. If the pulleys have very little friction, or I'll say no friction, then it should be the same amount of force after the cable goes through that pulley. And when it goes through here, it should also be the same amount of force. And after it goes through that pulley, it should be the same amount of force. I am pretending here that the pulleys have no friction. But the neat thing here is we've got this force here, here, there, and there. And if this is 100 pounds of force, that's 100 here, 100 here, and 100 here, and 100 here, you're going to be able to lift 400 pounds with just lifting with 100 pounds. So the force that we put in gets multiplied four times as much because that force was the same all the way through that cable and we have four strands of that cable all pulling here. We could look at it a different way. We could look at it not in terms of the force, but in terms of the distance. So if I want this hook here to raise up that distance, I've got to take out that much slack through each section of the cable. So the whole thing raises up that distance. Well, if I want this whole thing to raise up this distance, that's what I'm going to be able to get out with my force. But to do that, I got to take out four times as much slack out of that cable to have, you know, like if I have four feet here, this will come up one foot, one foot, one foot, and one foot. So we put in four times the distance that we got out. We should get out four times as much force as we put in because ideally this times this will equal this times this. All right, so this seems like an obvious question, but what is the advantage to using a machine? It's an obvious question, but let me continue that obvious question. Why would you choose to lift a car with this thing versus just with your hands? Mm -hmm. It's an obvious question, but the machine will multiply your force. The machine does not multiply the work that you do, it only multiplies the force. So what that does is, and, and that introduces this new term called mechanical advantage. The question was, what is the advantage to using a machine? Well, the advantage is it multiplies your force. That's an advantage. So when I'm asking for the actual mechanical advantage, I'm asking how much did it actually multiply your force? And you can calculate that by taking the force that you were able to get out divided by the force that you put in. So you can put some numbers there. Let's say that we push with 250 newtons a distance of 0.5 meters. And we were able to get out 5,000 newtons, but only up a distance of 0.02 meters about two centimeters. So what's the actual mechanical advantage? Remember the advantage is it multiplies your force. All we're asking for is how much did it actually multiply your force? So you can take the force that you got out divided by the force you put in and you get 20. What's the units on that number? Not newtons because there's newtons on top and newtons on the bottom they cancel, there is no unit. It is just a number. You just took your force, you took this force here, multiplied it by 20 to get this force here. In theory, we should be able to do that with the uh, actual distances. In theory, if I put, if I get out 20 times as much force as I put in, I should have to put in 20 times as much distance as I got out. Okay, but that's only if the work in equals the work out. So you should be able to theoretically calculate the mechanical advantage by the ratio of the distance you put in and the distance you got out. Be careful, this is out 
over in, but this is in over out. So if I wanted to calculate the theoretical mechanical advantage, I would take the distance I put in, which is right here, divided by the distance I was able to move that thing, and I get 25 in this case. And again, there's no units on that number because meters over meters cancels, and it's just a factor. So this thing theoretically should have multiplied my force by 25, but it only actually multiplied my force by 20. It wasn't as efficient as we were hoping for. So ideally, the work we put in equals the work we get out. Uh, but in reality, some of the work we put in, we don't get out quite as much. And work and energy, remember, are very nicely related. So if I put energy into my machine, some of that energy is going to be used to do other forms of work. For example, some of the energy might be used to make noise if the motor squeaks. It might make heat. I, I should say motor. I sh it's a simple machine. It's not a gas motor or anything. Uh, so the energy I put in, if it makes heat or sound, well, some of that energy was lost to those things and we wouldn't get out quite as much. So if I put in 100 joules and get out 100 joules, well, that would be the ideal situation where it's 100% efficient. But if I put in 100 joules and I only get out 75 joules, we can easily calculate how efficient it was by just taking the ratio of those two numbers. Efficiency is how much work we got out divided by how much work we put in. And you will never, 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 never get out more work than you put in because that's the same thing as saying you got out more energy than you put in and that would violate conservation of energy. So it's always work out divided by work in. So if I take 75 divided by 100, this example was 75% efficient. Back to this example, well, I, we calculated the theoretical mechanical advantage by taking the ratio of the forces. We calculated the actual mechanical advantage by taking, I did say that wrong, let me back up. We calculated the actual mechanical advantage by taking the ratio of the forces we took the theoretical mechanical advantage by taking the ratio of the distances. But now I want to calculate the efficiency. I have to calculate how much work I put in, force times distance. So I put in 125 joules of work. And then I have to calculate how much work I got out. I lifted 5,000 newtons, a distance of 0.02 meters. 5,000 times 0.02, I got out 100 joules of work. It looks like 25 joules of energy was transformed into heat or sound or um, those would be the main two things that it would transform into. So how efficient was this machine? You take the 100 joules divided by 125 joules and we're going to get a number, but what are the units on that number? Well, joules and joules would also cancel, so there are no units. But if I, if I take this divided by this, I get 0.8. If I move the decimal two places, I write the percent. So that's 80%. Okay, so we can calculate efficiency by work out over work in. All right, I do a lot of rock climbing. And um, one of the things that um, sometimes if I'm going to climb what's called a big wall, where you spend the night and you have to carry a lot of gear, uh, you have to set up a hauling system. You have to carry your food and water and everything that you need. And sometimes it's really hard to carry, you know, to lift 200 pounds up the wall. So uh, we use pulleys here. Uh, this is called an ascender. Usually this thing's flipped around and you use it to slide up the rope by and grabbing that handle so you can climb the rope. Um, but this is an ascender flipped up, um, upside down. 
there's a little camming device here that grabs hold of the rope. It, when it's upside down, it lets it slide this way, but won't let it slide this way on the rope. And this is called a wall hauler. It's just a pulley with a similar camming device right here. So you could pull down, and then the rope will, the wall hauler will grab the rope and not let it slide back. So you can pull down and let go, and it won't go crazy. Well, let's calculate the theoretical mechanical advantage. We can do it in terms of the distances in and out by figuring out how much slack is taken out of right here when you pull up. Okay? Or we could also do it pretending that the pulleys are 100% efficient, that there's no friction in the pulleys. So if I pull with 100 pounds here, that pulley is just going to change the direction and I'll get 100 pounds of tension here. It's going to change the direction and I get 100 pounds here. The pulley is going to change the direction and I get 100 pounds here. So when I pull with 100 pounds, how much can I actually lift down here? You might be tempted to say 400 pounds, but it's only actually 300 pounds. The reason is it's only this one, this one, and this one. So these two 100 pounds are pulling here. So you got 200 pounds on this and 100 pounds from that one. It all combines down here to get 300 pounds. Even though it looked like 400 pounds here, um, only three of them were actually connected to what you're trying to lift. So if, if this is 100% efficient, 300 pounds, you could lift 300 pounds by only pulling with 100 pounds. All right, let me show you this one. This one's a little more complicated. But this part of it right here is identical to this. Um, I should say that this had a, mechanic, a theoretical mechanical advantage of three. Let's see what the theoretical mechanical advantage of this is. If I pull with 100 pounds here, changes the direction, I get 100, changes the direction, I get 100, changes the direction, I get 100. So I should be able to get 300 pounds of tension in the rope where all three of those combine to right here. Well, 300 pounds of tension right there, pulley changes that, and I get 300 pounds here. Up here, this pulley changes that, and I get 300 pounds right there. So the 300, 600, and 900 all together is what I can lift. That was considered a compound machine where um, we have one machine pulling on another machine. And this is very fancy. Um, and actually, let me back up just a moment. Um, you probably would definitely would not want to use this because if you wanted to haul something up 100 feet, you would actually have to pull 900 feet worth of rope because the work you put in equals the work you get out. You can get out more force. You can get out nine times as much force, but you have to put in nine times as much distance. Now all that gear is pretty fancy and stuff, but you can just create uh, the same thing using what's called the trucker's hitch. It turns the rope into a pulley. So when you pull right here, you have tension here, here, and there. You can actually get a theoretical mechanical advantage of nine. Uh, sorry, three. I said that wrong. Theoretical mechanical advantage of three. All right, let's look a little bit more detail at levers, and then we'll be done here. But um, maybe it's not so important to identify if it's class one, class two, or class three, but I'll cover them anyway. So this is my load. I'm gonna make an effort, and this little pivot point is called the fulcrum. Scissors here are a good example of a class one lever. We put effort here, that's the fulcrum or the pivot point, and right there is um, where the um, resistances or the load that you're trying to do work on. A class two lever, the fulcrum is off to one side and the load is in the middle. We lift up here and a wheelbarrow is a good example of that. You put a load right here and you lift up right there. Just a simple machine. And tweezers are a good example of a class three lever where we lift up here 
and the load is way out there. Now one troubling thing here is if I lift this up just a little bit, it's going to come up a lot, and uh, which means we got out more distance than we put in. We have to put in more force than we get out. Okay? And a, a drawbridge like this would also be another example of a class three lever. Okay, um, so let's just look at maybe the geometry of this just a little bit and be able to calculate the theoretical mechanical advantage of the different levers. So here's my pivot point, my fulcrum, and when you rotate this down, if you push right here and move it this distance, it only came up this distance. So this was the distance I put in, this was the distance I got out. Well, we have two triangles. And this angle here is congruent to that angle there. I hope you've had geometry, but those are called vertical angles. Uh, it's a right angle here and a right angle there. So we have the angle-angle similarity theorem, which says if two angles of one triangle are congruent to two angles of another triangle, then the two triangles are similar. And the mo important thing is corresponding sides are in proportion. So this side of my yellow triangle divided by this side of my green triangle would be equal to this side of my yellow triangle divided by this side of my uh, green triangle. So when we're calculating theoretical mechanical advantage, we take the distance in divided by the distance out, but we can also now calculate that by the length of this lever arm divided by the length of this lever arm. So that divided by that will equal this divided by that. That would give you the theoretical mechanical advantage. All right, so if I have a wheelbarrow here, and um, I'm just showing you the distances here, but what's the theoretical mechanical advantage of a wheelbarrow? Well, you might think two, because this was two times what this distance was, but it actually has a mechanical advantage of three, because our effort is three times as far from the fulcrum as the load is. So if I lift this up 12 inches, this is only going to raise up four inches, a third as much. So I only have to lift with a third as much force as what's in there. Scissors. The me theoretical mechanical advantage of the scissors here, if I squeeze with effort and that's where the resistance is, well that has a theoretical mechanical advantage of one. If you want to increase the mechanical advantage, open them up like this. So now we're squeezing here, and I'm going to do this in terms of half distances here. So that's half, that's one, two, three, and this was just one half. It looks like this distance is three times what this one was. So when we open it up like that, we get a theoretical mechanical advantage of three. Tin snips here. You can get a massive mechanical advantage. So when you open this up here, uh, if this is one, two, three, four, five, six to one, the theoretical mechanical advantage would be six. Limousines stuck on the uh, steep uh, transition here from level to vertical, and a lot of people, you know, may go grab a log and a board or and a rock and something, but um, they often don't realize how to use this thing. If they put it here and here, it's only a mechanical advantage of one, because this distance is the same as that distance. If we change the lever arm and make this a lot longer than this, we should be able to get up a lot of distance. We do get it at the expense of, um, I'm sorry, we get out a lot of force and we get out at the expense of distance. We'd have to put in a lot of distance and only get out a little distance. I've only given examples so far where the mechanical advantage is greater than one, and that seems really neat. But this is a lever, it's a class one lever, 
The fulcrum is right between the effort and the resistance. But if you look at this, what's the theoretical mechanical advantage? Remember, it's the distance I put in divided by the distance I get out. I get out one, two, three, four times what I put in. So the mechanical advantage is only one fourth. But that's okay, it's advantageous still because you can dig deep trenches and you've got something here that can provide a lot of force. Your bicep, if you look at um, you know, just your bones and your biceps here, um, let's calculate the mechanical advantage of your forearm. So it's gonna pivot here at the elbow. Your bicep attaches right here and provides uh, lift right there. And then we put something in our hand way out here, but this is our effort. That's what we put in is at this little distance. And our what we get out is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times the distance. The theoretical mechanical advantage is one ninth. So to lift 40 pounds, we have to pull with our bicep with 360 pounds. But that's okay because our biceps are really, really strong. Uh, it just, you can't lift something so heavy because it's out there at such a distance. Anyway, that's a little bit about simple machines. The big idea is the work you put in equals the work you get out, ideally.